They tend to be fairly expensive, as you might imagine, since it's the broadest form of intellectual property protection. And just as a really rough number, I tell clients to budget $20,000 per patent per country over the lifetime of the patent. Okay, it might be less than some countries, might be more in other countries, it varies a little bit. That's what we're doing rough estimate. Thanks a lot. That's not the expensive part either. The expensive part is the enforcement of the patent. They don't enforce themselves. If someone's infringing a patent right by making, using, or selling a product or a method you have a patent claim on, you still have to sue the infringer. Uh, and the average cost of a patent infringement case, they start at half a million, you go up. <laughs> so now I'm going to delve into a little bit of the nitty gritty of uh, the patent stuff. Uh, and we're going to talk about patent types. In the US, we have three kinds of patents the utility patent, the design patent, and the plant patent. Next, there's also something called a uh, US provisional application. And I emphasize this word application because provisionals never make patents. They're just applications. They never take the next step. Next slide. Um, patents are geographic uh, in nature. So if you have a U.S. patent, it only covers the U.S. If you want to protect your product in Canada, you have to look at the Navy patent. Um, so uh, there's also a treaty, it's almost global, near enough to count, um, that allows you to file in those other countries up to one year after your initial filing. So when you start your patent clock ticking, for example, a U.S. patent application, you have one year to get your, your non-U.S. patent application on file in whichever countries are interested in getting protection. Okay, now I'm talking really fast. Everybody still with me? Uh, next slide. Yes. Is that one year after, so if you do the provision all, you have a year, yes. and is that an extra year? After the official filing, I didn't understand the question. So you have it one year after the provisional patent to file in the U.S. Wait. So once you file in the U.S., you have an extra year. No. For filing if you want elsewhere. To start your clock as of that provisional filing date. Okay. One year is one year. Okay, so that's one you year. You can abandon that one year and then start your one year clock after the first year. Sort of what two years, but that first year then is gone. Okay. It doesn't matter when 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 we got approval. Like it depends on the filing date, mm -hmm. not the approval date. It's I different. actually didn't hear anything. Okay. <laughs> filing date and approval date are different or similar. The priority date is the earliest date that you're entitled to. The filing date is the date that you file a given application. Okay, and the approval date would be different. Approval is something completely different, way down the road. So if after one year of filing date, so and how long will it take to approve the mutual? Oh, three to five years. Three to five years. Three to five years to get approval to get the patent issued. Okay, next slide. So we have something called a PCT application, which comes which comes out of these global treaties, which is an application like a provisional, never makes a patent, but it is a single application that allows you to cover something like 180 different countries. Because it never issued into a patent, you still have to then go and file locally in Canada, in Europe, in Japan, etc. Okay, and that's something that a lot of people miss. People talk about these, they call them PCT patents. And so people think they are going to be a patent someday. They don't make patents, they're PCT applications. Okay? Um, it, it does, however, allow you to delay all of your foreign filing decisions. And so what you've done is essentially pay a free hefty in order to delay your foreign filing decision up to two and a half years. If you started with that one year the provisional a year ago, you don't even have a year and a half left. You're trying to get worldwide patents. Uh, is there any sort of uh, cost of sale to communicate for countries with all the countries? Yes. You may not need any protection from all. Yes. But uh, <coughs> is it still just about 20 days? It's a rough number. Yeah, it's still, you still have to pay it in every country. Some countries will be cheaper. The developing world tends to be cheaper. Um, the countries that we're most interested in, things like Japan and Europe, tend to be more expensive. Um, there is, however, going to the next slide, 
a regional patent in Europe. And it's not the only regional patents. There are regional patents <coughs> in Africa, uh, the Gulf Coast, the Gulf, the Gulf, the Gulf Coast countries. Well, it is Gulf Coast countries. Um, and there's some in Russia and Kazakhstan and things like that. But this is the most important one. This is the one that people tend to use. The European Regional Patent is an application that covers a number of countries and does eventually make a patent. <laughs> Uh, it's a little more expensive because you're covering something like 20, 24 countries. It's, it's actually a lot, but it's pretty expensive to file. To file a piece of and you still have to go and enforce it locally in each country. And at the end of the day, when you get a key keypad, which is second, you still have to um, translate your claims into the local language. And in addition to that, in Europe, of course, you have a patent system in each of the countries. So if you know you're only interested in England if you're never going to France, which is a reasonable thing, then you could just file in England. So this is an option if we miss the 2.5 years, uh, that, that delay period for the PPP. Is this a, is this a separate option that we could do? You, the one year that you have to file foreign exists. You don't get to extend that. If you miss it, you miss it. Okay, you can extend it out to two and a half by filing the PCT and make, and then now, two and a half years later, you can make your decision about in the EP and in Japan and in Canada and Australia. You don't have a two and a half year decision that from your initial filing date in the US or is that from your, your priority date? It's a little tricky outside the US, I don't know what the rules are outside the US. It's sort of equivalent, but they get read a little bit. Next slide. Okay, so going back to some of the some of the uh, nitty gritty details, uh, the patent term. How long does it last? The design patent is 14 years of term, and that starts from your priority date. So obviously, the first year that you're not getting a patent, it's kind of wasted. Utility and plant patents last 20 years. The exception is the provisional year doesn't count against term. So if I start in in 2014 as provisional. My patent term is going to go out to 2035. That first priority year doesn't, the provisional year doesn't count against term. And then the other except, exception is that we have uh, a little bit of patent term restorations for things that are delayed in the FDA. And Andrea and Gail will touch on that maybe. Maybe not. It's pretty detailed. It's pretty detailed. Uh, <laughs> the FDA stuff is very detailed. You want a whole lot of that. Next slide. Okay, so what do you, what do you have to, to do to get a patent? It's got to be new, useful, and non-obvious, and you can patent darn near anything, although the Supremes are constantly mucking with that. Processes, machines, manufacturer, compositions, and matter, methods, um, and improvements thereof. Pretty much anything you can get a patent on. Um, and I, I bold the word new because that's a key point for you to know. It has to be new. Don't publish it before you apply it. Okay, particularly important since the law changed. And in the uh, don't offer to sell before applying for patent. Now, is this uh, only offering to sell in a public domain, or uh, even if they were looking to uh, potential venture capitalists or others in a private setting? That's a very tricky, very good question. So, yes, an offer to sale, sell counts as a public use essentially, and and you know, it's no you if you've offered it to sale, right? Um, venture capitalists can be a little, it's usually confidential, it's not necessarily going to count against it. And then you don't really sell to a venture capitalist. It's different from selling to a consumer or to a company. Yeah. But the company could also then come up with it. So say if, if it's a pharmaceutical company and it wants to sell to a strategic partner, um, so for example, he might do that. Uh, 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 I would be yeah. very cautious about that because we have to look at that. That's probably going to count against you. Anyway, you would like to. Like at least send it for a provisional patent before trying to sell it. Absolutely, you should file a provisional patent like before you do anything. <coughs> okay, next. So there, are, there are some important concepts that that I'd like to come across, get get across to you, um, relating to infringement, prior art, and dominance and freedom of the operator. We always call it FTO. Um, so next slide. So when you're when you're looking at infringement, this is what blocking effect a patent has, what market 
barrier does it create? Then you have to start with plain construction. We read the entire patent history, the back and forth of the patent office, uh, to determine what the claims do and don't cover. Um, we compare then the claims, as we determine what they mean, against the accused product. And every element or its equivalent has to be in the accused product. Okay? So when you're thinking about infringement, do I infringe someone's patents? Look to the last page and start with the claims. Okay? Next slide. In contrast, when you're thinking about prior art, remember I said it had to be new. So everything that's already published and or offered for sale, etc., is prior art. So when you think about a patent as prior art, blocking your own issuance of patents, the whole thing matters. The entire specification, the claims, the drawings, everything. Yes. Oh, uh, I was. Oh, my time. Yeah. Oh, So remember, for infringement, the claims control. For prior art, you got to read the whole thing. The whole thing counts. Next slide. Uh, and then finally, going into this issue of dominance. Uh, I told you uh, at the beginning that the patent gives you a right to exclude. It doesn't give you a positive right to sell your own product. You may or may not have a right to sell your own product. Uh, and that depends on whether or not there are dominant patents. Next slide. So when you think about dominant patents, what it means is that there's someone came before you with something that's a little broader that still covers your claims. So my example is with, uh, with chairs. This is a pretty simple one. So my patent I have a chair in the back at right angles to the seat. If you just look at it, you can see it at the back at right angles to the seat, a downwardly depending leg, and a base at the bottom of the leg. And we've got horizontal arms connecting the back and the seat. So I go look at the prior art, uh, the prior patent, and see what's out there. Next slide. And I found an earlier patent, say it's seven years earlier than mine, so it's still in existence, it hasn't expired. And it claims a chair with a back at right angles to the seat. And with at least one downwardly dependent leg under the seat, sufficient to port, support the chair at a distance from the surface. Or you probably should say sufficient to support the seat at a distance from the surface, right? So compare this claim now to my chair that I've invented. Next slide. It said a chair with the back at right angles to the seat. You've got that. Yeah, and at least down one downwardly depending leg under the seat, sufficient to support the seat at a distance from the surface. That earlier claim reads on my chair, doesn't it? So I don't have freedom to operate or FTO because there's a dominant patent out there blocking it. That, that's an issue that has to be addressed before I can start selling chairs. Um, lots of ways to address it. We won't go into that now. Next. Okay, so just to close up, talking a little bit maybe about uh, some budget issues. Um, they are expensive. Uh, I said about 20k per patent per country over the lifetime. If you just think about the starting cost, the cost to draft and file a patent application. <coughs> the U.S. provisional really can be darn near any price. You can do it yourself, right? Um, so it starts at 1k and goes on. At the U.S. utility application, which is your normal basic U.S. patent application. Prices range uh, depending on the technology and, and how many pages you have, but say in the 6 to 12k range. The BCT application is higher because of the filing fee price. And there, there's actually quite a lot of people working with this. So, for example, say 9 to 15 price. So, when you're a new company, you might be able to file your own provisional, get that on at least on file before you even speak to a patent attorney. But you know what? One year. You've got to have six to twelve or nine to fifteen thousand dollars to get it back. You don't want to do that one by yourself, right? So, um, for a lot of startups, uh, particularly in the in the biotech area, they're, they're probably still working on inventor funds at one year. Uh, so, next slide. So, um, the moral of that story is you have to think ahead uh, with a realistic idea of what your budget is going to be like at one year at two and a half years, right? You've got to plan ahead knowing how much money you're really going to have. So it's always good in the life sciences, in anything medical, to start with you as a provisional. It gives you a year to tinker with the invention, gives you a year to find the money to pay a patent attorney, and that whole year doesn't count against your patent term. That's a good thing. 
And then at the one year, the chances are you want to be able to file both U.S. and CPT. So pick one. Pick whichever one you can afford. If you can afford PCT, fine. And then you know uh, the chances are you, you might not be able to afford PCT. Then you can only file in the U.S. Or you, even if you do file PCT, but at two and a half years, you still can't afford to file in Europe, in Japan, in Australia, in Canada. Okay? So that's very common. It's more common than not. So that means that even as you're writing your first patent application, think about your second patent application. Because by the time that you file and get ready to make your foreign filing decisions for the second application, by then, you'll either have hold it or you'll have the money. Right? That's the whole thing. Anyway. So think about the second generation patent. What are you going to put in the second patent? Next slide. So the chances are that your first patent application is going to be prior art against your second. Uh, and there's a few things that you can do to deal with that. You can file your second patent before the first one publishes. That removes it worry about the prior art. You can file within a year of it publishing. In the U.S., we have something called a continuation of part, or CIP. Uh, doesn't work outside the U.S., but it's a possibility here. Or, knowing that you're going to have to deal with your own prior art, you can plan ahead and do direct head-to-head -head experiments that show that your new drug is so much better than that old one. You know, maybe it's got better toxicology, uh, maybe uh, it's bit more soluble, whatever, right? Um, and then finally, I would say, just as another brief dipping my toe into the FDA issue, um, that in the drug area, at least, we have some called therapeutic agreements ratings. If you get an A rating, the most state laws allow you to automatically substitute a gen an A-rated generic for a name brand drug, which is why you lose so much market share uh, when an, an A-rated generic enters the market. There's also B-rated generics. They do not can't, they're not equivalent. It's essentially they're not therapeutically equivalent. They don't get the automatic substitution. They don't capture the market share. So even if your second patent it's much, much narrower. And you would say, well, we have to have broad patent protection. If you have a really narrow one, in combination with a therapeutic equivalence rating, it can still be a profound barrier to market entry. I bet nobody understood that. Yeah, OK. Well, I'll sit down, and maybe we'll have a question about it. Is there any other people on the slide? Good. I guess I go ahead and take a seat. Hi, I'm Andrea Perens, and uh, I'm an MBA So for about 15 years or so, I'm just a private practice. Representing a whole bunch of different businesses, this is the next one. Um, businesses in all of these categories that are regulated by the FDA. So the US FDA uh, dictates for each of these five categories how the product can make the Everything that's on the right, um, I'm not really going to talk about this because I think um, from the, what I understand from this audience, our interests are really the column on the left, which is biologics. You think of living cells, the tissues, and the organs, vaccines, blood products. FDA regulates those very similar to pharmaceuticals, compounds. They have cell phone launches because, of course, they are living. They don't have shelf life the way it is. Drugs, those would be your typical chemical compounds. So mass produced, off the shelf, through your shelf life type of, um, of agent, and then medical devices. A commonality of all three of those in that side of the slide is that they all have or tend to affect your disease uh, by diagnosis, um, mitigation, maybe for treatment or cure, or your product is designed to affect the structure of function of the body. This is what's called intended use. FDA will determine which product category you fit into based on that intended use. And you can, in fact, have a combination of products. This is where life is really interesting. You can have something that is a biologic, a medical device, and a drug. If you think of uh, like a surgical mesh that you put uh, living cells on, plus chemical compounds to encourage healing. So that would actually hit all three categories because you're spending a lot of time with that. Here. So let me go to the next slide. So understanding which category you fall into dictates how you get to market. 
because FDA has defined paths for each of those categories. Um, a great example is looking at the devices. So FDA divides devices into three classes based on risk, risk behavior. A class one device is something that acts on the body um, for disease, but does it in a mechanical way. It's not chemical, it's not metabolized by the body, yet the intended effect of it is still on the DVR structure of the body. So a class one device is something like a tongue detector, um, a band-aid. So with a class one device, you have the newest band-aid, and you think you're going to get a band-aid that runs for its money. You can go to regulation, look at the definition of a band-aid, and then you essentially mimic your band-aid off of the, the band-aid as defined by the FDA and enter the marketplace. Now there's certain regulatory requirements about how you make it, but you don't have to go to the FDA, which is but of course, it's much simpler and cheaper than the device. Class two devices um, are more complicated, typically a higher risk of, uh, product. But FDA um, will typically uh, it could be a prescription device, it could be not could be you know off the shelf. But FDA for a class two device typically wants you to do a submission phase of the notification. Um, technically it's called a 510K. And you're basically showing the agency how your device is like the device that's already in the market. Um, the classic example is called the TENS device, which treats pain through electrical stimulation. Lots of TENS devices out there, but say you've made a TENS device that is more portable. And so you submit to the agency how your engineering tests show that your TENS device works very similar to what they're against. You specifically test yours head-to-head -head against another device already in the market. Sorry, I don't have to say this person. Well, say your device is truly novel. There are no cutting devices. Or you fall into class three. Class three is the highest risk in the ICD. I'm talking about surgical diagnostic devices. Um, things where the agency said it is so critical that these function correctly that we cannot risk them entering the marketplace without us doing so. And typically for a class three device, they want testing on you. So um, the device world is really um, interesting in that respect that you can actually enter the marketplace in two of those classes, class one and class two, without testing the product. So, in the world of FDA, I think a great example of um, how that plays out is the recent um, point screen meeting. I don't know if you guys have read about that at all. It's really interesting to watch, and I'm sure they're, they're having fun. And FDA issued a warning letter at the end of 2013. This is a company that sells genetic testing directly to people. You don't have to go to them. You send in sample, they run genetic mapping, they send you back a map, and up until the warning letter, they were also telling you, you have this cancer gene, or you have this allergy, or you have an indication of this. So they were diagnosing people directly to a consumer based on genetic mapping. And in the warning letter, the agency revealed that 23andMe has actually been working with FDA since 2009. And the agency and the company were not able to agree on which category this um, product concept fell into. Um, it's a really interesting letter. Apparently, the agency was actually working to try to get some of that mapping, some of the pieces, to be a class two device, to, to enable the company to do this direct to consumer genetic counseling for certain diseases that, that they felt were appropriate. But other diseases, um, they gave specifically the example of uh, breast cancer, they wanted the company to go the PMA, the, the clinical trial, the class three drug. Too high risk. Too risky that someone may get their 23 me before, say, oh my gosh, I'm going to get breast cancer, I'm going to go have a surgical intervention, 
I'm going to go look and see if they're now, something like that, and making a decision based on it. So uh, that letter really shows the agency thinks that they explain all of that in there. And it shows how the agency looks at what is an acceptable risk for class two and what is an unacceptable risk, and therefore must have a higher level of security, a higher level of pre-market. I've been talking a lot about use. Um, the agency also regulates how you make your product. Let me go to the next slide. So, making your product, whether it is a pharmaceutical agent or a medical device, the agency has to All throughout the laws and regulations that dictate how you make your product, the agency relies on this concept called quality. What quality by design means that your entire process is strictly controlled so that you know um, through standard operating procedures, which is basically your written instructions, um, the scrutiny that you put into who you buy your raw materials from. You're not just going to Bob's supply house because he's the cheapest guy in town. You look into Bob, you know that Bob is going to produce your raw materials exactly the same way every single time. So when you put that into your product, your product comes out exactly the same way every single time. And that concept of product uniformity is critical, whether you have a device or a pharmaceutical. And all of these elements go directly into that. That website up there, that's the uh, International Council. This is not just a concept of the U.S. This is an international concept. Um, if you are looking at the international marketplace, um, I recommend going and looking at ICH, um, great reading, that kind of thing. But it really goes into this whole concept of putting into your entire system from start to finish that you know when it comes out. You don't even have to test it when it comes out of your name. You know exactly what it's going to look like, how it's going to operate, and it's going to perform the same way every single time. FDA has rejected the notion that you can have a pretty good system, and at the end, the producer product, you test it, I think it tests you test it. fantastic, I really know. They, they will literally jump all over you if that's your approach to manufacturing. Instead, they want you to control that process all the way through. So when you get to the end, you know that it is going to pass. So test it at the end to prove that it's going to pass, but you have such integrity in the system that you are going to pass. And that's, that's the root of quality of the product. So is this just an incredibly expensive regulatory burden that FDA puts on people? Some people think so. Um, I would argue on the people side, actually, it has great business benefits. So if you think about producing something that takes raw materials that are investment, an investment of time, an investment of equipment, people that you trained, and somewhere in that process, you have a multi-step process, something has failed. If you only test your product at the very end, then you have wasted the materials that we're at that point of failure to that point of final product. You've wasted the materials that we need those additional steps, wasted time, the equipment, the use of the plant or the contract manufacturer, however you do that. So if quality by design will actually save you time and effort in my book. Um, it will also affect your cost of goods. Again, because from a business standpoint, how much it costs you to make your product versus Sell it for has a huge impact on your bottom line. Which is critical. So if you have spent more making that product, and then you had a product failure on step two, but you don't discover until step ten, it's wasted all of that effort in it. Yes, sir? Yes. I was just curious, uh, FDA provides a standard or how do you know that I mean how do you know that, okay, this is the standard and meets uh, um, FDA approval? Okay, so good question. Um, typically, no, they don't tell you that, which can be very frustrating. Um, 
if it is a medical device that is well defined by the agency, has predicate device, then yes, you are going to be you are going to have a much better sense of the standard you are um, even from a point of designing your in process. On the chemical side of things, you can rely on international standards or US FDA recognized <coughs> standards like the US Pharmacy or the AOAC, which is the American Association of Analytical Chemists. So there are some um, quasi industry association that FDA feels has such high scientific integrity that if one of those organizations issues a standard to say, this is how you should use early tests, and you can say, I follow the US clean methods, but you want to do an early test, then FDA generally is that. Not every time, but generally. However, if you have a truly novel product and you have truly novel testing to determine in process when your manufacturing is going the way it should be, then typically FDA's expectation is that you have um, what's called validated your testing. And validated <coughs> is you think about the repeatability of a scientific research. You have fantastic results the first time you the real trick is doing it over and over and over again to getting that exact same result. So that is called validation. Same idea in the main part. Um, why don't we go to the next slide? So we've been talking about making the product. And I said that FDA also regulates how you use the product. And you go back to that 23 and thing where FDA was saying some of those indications, okay, yes, make it where you get that genetic testing. Some indications we think are too sensitive, too complicated. Consumers should not be making those kind of things. In that case, then you are doing the clinical testing before you can launch your product. And that clinical testing on humans is where you establish how the product will be used. This picture shows the classic chemical pharmaceutical. So you discover your product, you go into what's called a preclinical phase. This is before you're actually using on humans. You are still rigorously making your product, so you have a nice uniform product, and you test it on it. FDA generally requires animal testing. We're not to the point yet where we have synthetic models for FDA. So um, preclinical is animal models. To um, if you have a tumor disease at that point, if you know you're going to target, if you know the animal model for that disease, and you do proof of concept in this disease from a certain dose of that disease, you can do it. If FDA is satisfied by that, then you go in your phase one trial, which is your safety trial, small number of humans, um, only looking at safety. Here is where it's called valley of death. That's a term actually used in industry because of so many drugs that fail in preclinical or phase one. The reason for that is because they thought they were making their product uniformly in the discovery phase. But for whatever reason, they didn't write it down the way they thought they were making it, or the equipment wasn't calibrated the way they thought it was, and they cannot repeat those results. And when it starts going into between animals or it starts going into humans, they cannot get the results. Drugs died in that phase. A point for reimbursement. So I'll talk about this on the next slide. But even early on, when you are developing a product, you need to think about how how will I be paid if my product is going to be And if you're in the healthcare world, you're typically talking about Medicare, Medicaid. So you choose your endpoints. In other words, you're going to test a human. What are my what are my clinical um, points of reference, symptoms, or, or lab results um, that I want to see a change in, a difference in, that I know will get me to the point where on the reimbursement side, uh, Medicare, Medicaid will be interested in the product. And clinicians are going to want to use it. Not just statistically significant. Scientists get very excited about how oh, statistically significant result. Well, a doctor wants to use your product only to actually point to their patients. 
So you go through phase development, you spot your product, fantastic, you get approval, your interaction with the FDA truly never ends. You get post approval, you're still dealing with them. All through your launch, all through your launch. Concept of reimbursement. If you're dealing with reimbursement issues when you design the product, you choose how it's an operating clinic, and in the end, you've got your FDA approval. You really want to get in the marketplace. Now you've got to go deal with healthcare systems for reimbursement. Okay, so for a health-related product or a medical device or a drug. This is generally the best and fastest commercialization. Over on the lower right, you've got your typical and critical regulatory path. You've got the file, you've got approval, now you're in your post marketing phase. FDA is actually up in your upper right, too. They're all over your manufacturing, your labeling, your packaging, your very helpful. That, uh, upper upper right is uh, the reversal side that I talked about. And then down here in the bottom is sales and marketing. We turn this over to Mitch to talk about brand vision, but very quickly I've not talked about how FD is important to say about your product. And this is an unfortunate reality is that uh, FD will determine based on your approval if you're a medical device or a pharmaceutical, what you can say about how your product is. I'm going to stand over here so I can see the slides as they come up. Uh, my name is Meg Bowler. I'm a law partner with Kansas Bell Law. I am a registered patent attorney. Uh, but in, uh, in Texas, it's typical that when you start out as an intellectual property attorney, you learn everything that can break my copy like you name it. And um, I always was interested in trademarks and I have been working in uh, the branding area for, for quite a while as well as in the patent. And areas. So uh, my talk is not going to be about branding designer jeans or anything like that. It's going to be branding that you need to consider when you've got a startup company. And even, even if, you, if you're just working on products now and you're not a company, it's just good things to remember because hopefully you will have a company in the future. And these things are great to have in the back of your mind so you'll address these properly for, for your branding. And um, yeah, they're trying to have and so a lot of times companies want to come up with these really cool brand ideas. And that's great, but you have to really understand where you're going with the brand. And um, going to the next slide. And you can just search for uh, there. And um, what I'm going to try to cover are the uh, four things on this slide. And so we'll just go. And these all have to do with brand qualities. And I'll just go to the next slide. And you can go ahead and hit the next there. <clears throat> uh, for those of you who are in uh, the MBA program here and you are taking marketing, which is great, you will know the first thing you need to know is know your customer. Uh, uh, you need to, even when you're developing what your medical device, your drug, whatever, this all kind of fits in with everything, you really need to kind of start vetting your concept. And, and uh, not blowing any confidentiality, so you blow your, your ad protection. Start vetting your concept with your customer and figure out what the customer is going to be looking for in your particular product because you need to include that in your branding strategy. Uh, the amazing thing about doing this is that sometimes when you start talking to your potential customers, whether they're physicians or hospitals or whatever, you're going to find out issues with existing products that are going to be competitive to your products that you may be able to incorporate some of those ideas in your own concepts. And that's even going to help you with your, with your patent uh, applications to include um, some advantages that, that sometimes the engineers and the product developers get so wrapped up and so in love with the product, they've got really tunnel vision. They don't really understand what the outside world is interested in in a product. And so that is that is part of branding. Uh, the other um, uh, thing to remember is 
that the customers of the brand, not the engineers, not the software designers, not the biochemists. So you really have to be very, very, very customer oriented. And customers create the market. You, know, you can come up with, with some wonderful technical invention, and if there's no market for it, well, then that's, you know, that's wasting a lot of money in your time, too. So if we go to the next slide, um, this is a uh, classic positioning branding strategy slide that has the key, the four key um, elements that you put together for a branding strategy. And um, I'm going, I've got a couple of case studies that will go through this, but if you're, you need to know why your product is going to be appealing to the customer target. Like Andrew was talking about, you know, the doctors really want to see certain things in uh, the new drugs that are coming out. If those qualities are not in your product, then you need to address that issue and then you move on. And because, what's your value proposition? And then you need to look at the rest of your competition. Why are you going to be stand out among your competition? And the because, the, the reason to believe um, is the, um, the the real value proposition that's going to sell that's going to sell your product. So this is this is all well and good to talk about these things uh, in the abstract. But um, full disclosure, this is one of our firm clients. Uh, it's a medical device company, Ortho Excel. We did not select the brand, so I can't take any credit for that. But it's a really great brand. Uh, this company actually won the Debate Award. A few years ago, the Texas Life Science Forum for the company with the best um, commercial uh, commercial product for commercialization, and in fact, they're, they're doing very well. And the, the founder of the company, uh, while they were working on developing the product, was spending two years on branding uh, and positioning. Two years on branding and positioning while they, while they were doing this. And this particular uh, product has a, a bite plate here that vibrates, and this is when you've got an orthodontic appliance on, it reduces the um, time to have, to have your braces on because of the vibration in parts. And I'll uh, answer about that later, so you can tell all about it, but I'm just going to talk about the branding. And the next slide, please, is, um, this is this is the product brand Celadent. And when they did their customer uh, research with the dentist in particular, they found out that the biggest issue for the dentist was safety. So every time you see their brand, you want to see fast, safe, and gentle. They found out, obviously, that for the patients, they were very, uh, they wanted to make sure that it was going to be gentle. And obviously, it's fast. Uh, that means that you get your braces off. And, and, magnitudes less time. So those were the three branding concepts. I won't, I won't read the positioning statement, but this is the positioning statement. And I think it's a very good idea for companies or when you're getting started with a concept to go through that, that positioning statement to see how you're going to put a finer point and focus where you're going with, with your company. And this has to do with branding, but it has to do with um, Anything else uh, in product development? I think the next slide is actually this is a slide from Rice University MBA students. Uh, a a uh, product that they were working on to come up with with a branding uh, package. Now this is for enterprise, and it was an enterprise software product that was to be used for small and medium-sized businesses who were going to be. Um, they needed to remotely access a number of different computer applications. Uh, but, the, but the point is, if you don't have a physical product and you've got a software product, right, and if your branding is even more important because, because you want to get across to the uh, company or to, to the investors and to your public, you know, what your, what your product is all about. And this was the enterprise software that was going to be really, really helpful. And the, the word technique uh, was chosen because it's got, it's a Greek word for craftsmanship. And this was really trying to make sure that everybody that was in this busy world was trying to be able to put together all their software products on their, 
on their iPad and a little puzzle piece um, really kind of convey that this was the, the, the puzzle piece to unlock uh, problems. And the next slide is the positioning uh, statement that was developed for this particular, uh, this particular product. Uh, now, the, what we see a lot now, the, the, the other product I was talking about was Ortho Excel. You know, Ortho and Excel kind of conjures up in your mind when you hear it the fact that it's a dental prop, uh, product and there was some kind of acceleration or fastness to the product. So, kind of put that together. Um, yeah, the, um, what you see a lot these days are very unique product names, very unique company names, very fantastical names. And the mayor of uh, San Francisco every Tuesday goes out uh, in the new enterprise zone that's been created downtown uh, to meet with new companies. And he says, I want to know what these, uh, find out what their crazy name means. Well, find out what their crazy name means. Is that really good branding? Well, that's, that's, a, that, that's a question. Now, there's some really good crazy names. And um, the next slide um, is Amazon.com. That was a, that, that name when Jeff Bezos started his company really didn't mean anything to anybody. But if you'll remember, he always had the tagline, the first biggest bookstore. So it was Amazon.com, the first visit to the bookstore. Well, now it's just the biggest store, period. But he knew to develop a catchphrase that people were going to put together with Amazon.com. And also, um, I don't have any of his early advertising, but my guess is it always had the first visit store when you saw Amazon.com. So the next slide, please. And go ahead. Uh, one of the items that you see when a company is kind of coming along and they're developing some products is uh, there will be a different unique name for each product. This is an issue that leads to brand clutter that also dilutes your image in front of the marketplace, in front of venture capitalism. Um, I can't emphasize enough picking one name, one brand, and building a family around that, rather than having a lot of different fantastical, unique, creative names that's great. But as far as branding, you really want to see, particularly initially, a real consistency with your presentation and your image to, for the, the point to remember your brand by whoever is your target audience, whether it's analysts, whether it's venture capitalists, whether it's potential customers. So um, scattered use of brand names is generally not good at all. And for many reasons, so I'll have the next slide. Will be is is mark clearance. Uh, we were talking about patent clearance, uh, trademark clearance is very important also. And, you know, later we have discussions we can get into to the issues there, but um, you don't, clearing a mark in the U.S. is fine if, you, if you're really getting some traction with your product and you know what your target markets are going to be, or you know where your competitors are going to be manufacturing, you really want to get your brand uh, clearance and make sure you're not going to have another party that's already registered the mark in, for instance, uh, China. Are, and China is very problematic. There are more registered trademarks in China than anywhere any other country in the world. Uh, so, and you want to make sure that you're going to have the freedom to use your brand outside the U.S. and inside the U.S. for that matter. So, um, next slide is uh, registration. Some more points there. Um, one, I, I recommend getting a federal U.S. Registration, uh, trademark registration, as soon as possible. Unlike the patent side of the shop at the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office, if you have a good clear mark, you get a, a federal registration within a year. Um, the, one of the issues that is a little bit 
technical is about is having to have your mark in college. You cannot get a trademark registration unless you have a mark in college. Now, say you're developing a vaccine, and you're not going to have it approved for years. Uh, what you may have with your company is expertise that you are selling as consulting to other companies, or you may have um, uh, some contract uh, manufacturing or contract work in the vaccine area that's coming to your lab. So you've got in commerce, you've got your buying and set, or, or actually you're selling your services. You can go ahead and get your registration for what you're doing, and then that is that is very important because it can actually help you with your uh, other IP. So uh, the next slide. Once you get your brand, uh, use it on everything. A brand is an adjective. It's not a noun or a verb. And just, just remember that. We had the technique, the technique enterprise software. Um, it, it, it's uh, the ortho or the Excel event, ortho Excel um, medical device. And uh, very often, people like to get cute and they'll use their brand name. As a, as a noun or a verb, that uh, is uh, impermissible and you will lose your uh, trademark rights. Uh, that's very possible. And I would put your registered trademark, or and even before it's registered, on, on everything in the company, digital header, footer, you name it, on everything. Because, on the next slide, uh, in the digital world these days, there's a lot of, as we know, copying and duplicating uh, your original work by third parties. And people are picking it up and, and putting it in their web pages. It's, it's amazing to me there are some really sophisticated companies that do this. And, and, but most of the time, what happens, or, or very often, when people start uh, importing your information onto their websites or whatnot, uh, they will leave your brand name on, on the actual content. And if that is the case, uh, then it is much easier to get a takedown if there is a registered trademark that has been imported in the content, a third party website that you're unhappy with. So that's another reason to get trademark registrations to just protect your your what, what would be copyrightable information, um, and also what I have run into also is you will have people. Uh, sometimes it's uh, with, uh, not the best intentions, or sometimes it's just uh, careless. Will somehow get some of your sensitive material that you don't want on the internet. And they will post it. And if there's a registered trademark that's within that sensitive material, that's on header or footer, whatever in your, in your content, it's much easier to go to the ISP and get a takedown and say, they are using my registered trademark without permission. Uh, take this down. You have a much better chance of doing uh, that one. So the next. Uh, this is, I wanted to go into non traditional branding. This is kind of a simple, uh, simple uh, visual here, but, but nonetheless, this is, this is not one of your high tech uh, medical devices. It's a, it's a back relaxer uh, <coughs> device uh, that uh, was developed. And what they did, and you can even do this like there's, there's a test tube holder that has the rings around the test tubes in different colors. There are sutures that have different colors uh, attached to them. But this particular company added the color features right here. And this is actually a trademark registration uh, illustration from the U.S. Canada Trademark Office. What they find is this blue color. And that has if consumers really like this particular device, they're going to look for the device with the blue coloration in it that they're, they're 
S5. And go to the next slide. Uh, and this is non traditional brain that you can cover it with a uh, cover it with a, uh, a trademark registration, general trademark registration. Uh, probably the most famous uh, branded uh, non traditional trademark is the uh, configuration of the Apple um, iPod configuration of the Apple products. And with what you have to remember is back when the iPhone came out, the, the phones that we had were kind of clunky, you know, fold over or pretty clunky kind of phones. And um, it's in the reading of these slides, and I'm going to save one of my old um, phones and a quick picture of it here. But, you know, how in the world did you get a brand protection on this? Well, it was different. Now, as everybody knows, probably Samsung and Apple are having a bad one. Thing, millions of dollars, uh, billions actually, and um, but but uh, Apple actually got a, a framework registration on this on this configuration. So when you're thinking about your product, this is for a physical product. If you can get a unique configuration that is is not functional in that minute, then you can get some pretty broad protection. Yes. Um, when you're trying to get a trademark approved, is it a similar process to a patent or is it just kind of back and forth off yes. the Yes, it's back and forth, but it goes very quickly. And um, typically, if you've done a good job in clearance, like I said, you'll get it within a year. I, 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 filed, I filed a trademark application like this is amazing. I filed one a month ago, and I got almost an approval yesterday. It's not, not, it's not like it's getting this off my hands. Maybe that's why I like it, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, mean, I get over it. <laughs> but uh, on, on the trademark side. Um, now, the protectable trade dress for your product, uh, it, it, whatever you're claiming is, is your protectable trade dress. It can be covered by a utility patent. That's functional aspects cannot be included. Um, there must be alternative designs available to the competitor. Um, if, if, if the feature you're trying to claim as a trademark is, is actually cheaper or easier to manufacture, such that if you've got exclusive rights to it, um, you would you would put out all of your uh, competition. And um, certain colors can't be protected. Um, yellow and orange, obviously, are safety colors. You can't protect certain colors. But, but like the, the blue um, parts of the little back or that sort of thing, that, that was not included. Um, okay. Social media. Um, the internet was predicted to lessen uh, competition because everybody's going to go to the lowest common denominator and, and I guess buy the cheapest thing and this is all this is all about. The internet has done nothing but created more <coughs> brand competition and more brand awareness. Now I'm getting a little bit over into the designer gene area, but you're going to want to use the internet for your particular brand presentations uh, for your for your new companies. So um, the internet is a great way to promote brand awareness and a global outlet. So, so. okay, uh, the good about social media, it's really good to sell obviously, or to just raise awareness or to position yourself in the space where you want analysts of the industry notice you, right? Um, and you need to understand what are the internet sites that you want to get recognized on um, to enhance your visibility for all kinds of reasons, not just to sell a product, right? And um, the as the outlets are multiplying, um, you know, there's a lot of different theories on, well, 
should you should you be tweeting all the time? Should you not be? Uh, most many companies now have their own Facebook page. Um, it more or less, I think, depends on where your uh, customer outlet is, and this is the kind of thing you find out when you're talking to customers. Because if you if you've got a software product, you're going to have a different social media profile you run, right? Um, but all of these are um, are things that to consider, and now you know you can have your own channel on YouTube, um, and uh, that's, that's created some issues too because I uh, need to make sure you know what's being posted. I invite our employees, which is the next slide. Okay, um, the social media, the really bad thing about social media, uh, from my standpoint, is that companies they need to and, and Startup and you really need to control their social media. First of all, if you've got a good branding message and a good branding presentation, it must be consistent. Uh, you do not want to have one look on the logo on one page and one look on the other. It, it, it tends, people tend to think that you're, you don't have your act together, it's inconsistent. So uh, having one person or a very situation for your social media, I think is very, very important. Um, also, um, the employees, sometimes employees can be your worst nightmare because I'll start using your brand properly as a verb or as a noun, and then you'll have um, some, if you ever do get into an issue where you have a protected trademark, some third party can say you weren't using your own mark properly. Um, the takedown, I mentioned takedown with um, um, having registered trademark. One of the things that I've noticed for a lot of my clients with all these online dictionaries, Wikipedia, etc., there is some really bizarre stuff that goes up on these websites about uh, everybody, uh, small companies, uh, startups, big companies, whatever. If you have a registered trademark and somebody is posting something dumb on Wikipedia or the Urban Dictionary or whatever, and your registered trademark is on it, it's much easier to get the thing changed or taken down or whatever. So that's another reason that I'm really a you know, big fan of getting it on the registered. So next slide. Uh, oh, this is, yeah, this is the friendly. Oh, yeah, this is this is what I was talking about. The friendly fire on the employees who are using the brain on alternate appearance um, uh, for uh, employees or colleagues uh, posting some material on the web. Uh, and this is the department of the administration. And uh, yeah, the, next, the next slide. Okay, this, this is a slide from. And this shows the IP overlap with Nexium. And you can have, uh, to go back, a patent on the drug. You can have trade secret on how you formulate, how you formulate particular ingredients that are approved by FDA, right, Andrea? They're pulling it all in, in here. Uh, you would have the copyrighted ads. I didn't get into copyright too much. But the good news about copyright that some people do not know is um, you don't have to have a copyright registration to protect your work of original authorship. As soon as you put it down on Facebook, it's protected. So copyright is easy. The trade dress for the pill pop, uh, this is mine, this is the branding. The, the purple pill, everybody knows this is purple pill, and uh, they've done a very good job of, of protecting that. And there was a design pattern for the unique pill right here. And this uh, not only could you get a design pattern for that, you, you could probably get a trade dress uh, registered trademark registry also for this. So um, I you know I think that well this for those of you go back you can go to the little part of it. Yeah this this is for those of you who have taken the course here I think this is useless because your textbook now is 
ever book. Okay. This is a great book for because it's very understandable for people who are interested in brand. Uh, it's a great book um, because the fourth edition is out now. You can get the third edition for thirty-five bucks. So I highly recommend this book. And then the final thoughts are. Um, you know, teach your mark to customers, get the framework registration, uh, consider non-traditional um, product packaging and um, other features that we discussed, and uh, maintain the brand vital now that you're going to um, how it's going to be used. Uh, okay, um, I'm gonna uh, I'm gonna Google that. That's the I, I sort go of Google this out like that, uh, and then um, uh, the, the biggest one that is really a, a problem is um, uh, you know is, is that a, is that a Xerox of the paper? It's a Xerox copy. That no, I, they would never say that. They, yeah, they would be losing. Yeah, it's, it's yeah, you could do the search engine. Google search process, you know, a Google website, a Google, a Google this. Yeah, if you, yeah. <laughs> Mm -hmm. No, exactly. The Excelident. No, it's the Excelident um, medical device. Or Excelident. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that's just that's just the law. I'm not saying it's right or wrong or whatever. But the, the point is, if you're using something as a verb, then it's a generic use. So that's the that's the issue. You want to avoid, for instance, aspirin was a brand name that came generic years ago. Escalator was a brand name that came generic. The whole list of, of brand names that came generic. So in other words, the brand name became part of the English language, and now it's no longer compatible with the brand name. You can't use brand names in aspirin. You need that. When like uh, somebody like there was a new startup, so you all these workers with social media uh, and brand and stuff, all these things go together like so you all these for at the time of the startup or you gradually like how do you go to yeah, that's a, that's a good question. How do you when you're when you're gonna start start up with a lot of things for branding? What how do you start? Um, you know, I would say first of all, um, uh, choose 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 a mark. You, you cannot get trademark protection on a um, on, on a descriptive word or descriptive uh, descriptive. Um, and for instance, um, you, you know, there, there are a lot of people that, that come up like, oh, I want it. I want my brand name to be um, Rabies Vaccine. Well, that's, that's descriptive of brand name, not Rabies Vaccine, it's something else. That's, that's great. But I think the first thing to do is try to pick a brand name that's going to be memorable, that may contain certain features that have the concept of what your goods or services is going to be all about without being totally descriptive of the product. And once you select a good brand and get a trademark registration on it, and use it a lot on everything the same way. Uh, I didn't go into the issues here, like there are certain color combinations are um, better in certain industries than others, like for Excel, you didn't see any red in the middle of the box, right? Some of these things are something that everybody wants. 
stuff. But that, the first thing is to get your, get your brand vetted uh, with customers. Because you can vet your brand with customers. That's not anything that's happening with uh, going on. See how customers react to it, uh, potential customers, or even friends and family, you know, your own little folks groups. And then they go right straight and start using What is the difference between TM and uh, your other yeah, That's a good question. Yeah. Uh, once you've selected your brand, you can use TM. There's no rules and regulations on using tools to prescript TM. The Arnda Circle can only be used for registered trademarks. Marks registered in the trademark. So, how does the TM fit into TM? The TM really doesn't protect you. Except for the fact that you're telling the world that this is my brand, I've selected this brand, this is, I do this, I do this is my brand. When you get the R in the circle, the federal government is a huge tax. So that's a little bit different. Yeah. Yeah. And that's the part of the know your customer, right? Know, know your customer, know what they're looking for. Is there any way to use the brain mark to gain access to the dot-com website? Like, do it, like if I was like starting a company, I would actually like go and see if the dot-com website is available. Yeah. But can you just like get the trade, the trademark, like within a year, then after that, like, go and try to get, get the dot com. com. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, that's a good question. The, the um, uh, domains, um, internet domains are, are different from trademark registration. And the, the, the only way you can get a domain name away from a third party if you can show that they registered that domain in bad faith and they were intentionally trying to keep the domain away from the trademark owner. Now, one of the ways you can show bad faith is this is you know, the cyber squad. One of the ways you can show bad faith is if somebody says, oh no, um, I didn't. I didn't know about you, but I'm not going to, you can't have this domain, you're going to have to pay me a million bucks. That can be, that can be shown to be bad faith, is holding up a domain for a lot of money. If somebody who has a rightful, um, rightful trademark uh, registration status. But it's typically, I'm kind of surprised that, it's typically good to have, um, to get your domain and your trademark at the same time and, and you know, if you if you love the trademark, but it's something that's going to be either the identical domain or a domain that's like an acronym of the trademark or something, you go you can maybe want to get the reset button. I think it's better in this day and age to have the domain and the trademark. If you have something interesting with the trademark, I'll give you a uh, well, they have to prove that you, if 
you selected a domain and it was you were starting up, you were perfectly good faith, you're using it, no, they can't go after you. They can't go after you. They can't go after you. Because you would have to, if, so, if somebody is not using a domain and they say, I'll charge you a million bucks and then you're, they're using it legitimately, then uh, they've got every right to do
freedom do I have now? Do I have to talk about my novel device? Uh, and, yeah. setting, and then also, does that not include me uh, if I wanted to say file for internet? Uh, no. Once you have a planning application on file, even if it's just a conditional, you can start to talk to people. And as long as you get your core patent application on file within the year, okay. so that priority thing covers everybody, everybody by virtual treatment. The places that have a time to treat are already yeah, it's like a lot. Yeah, and also, but you have to be really careful that what you discuss is what's in your program. Don't go beyond that. One of the things that you can do is file multiple original. But you keep protecting the confidential information that you're developing through the year. The, the rules are a little bit more um, detailed than that. There is some opportunity to get behind your own publication in the U.S. There are some opportunities to get behind them outside the U.S. as well. But it's tricky. The times vary. Uh, and who publishes them? The general assumption is what the policy does. Because you tell them that they get behind the policy. We never tell them that, but sometimes you can. And it's good. But it's good. And outside the US, it's really always. There's more opportunity than some of these. In six months academic, if you just don't want to go around, the one spot probably is traditional.